Referee is the debate. Continuing debate, uh, the Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I rise today, of course, to speak about Bill S-5, the bill amending SEPA, the Canadian Environmental Protection Act, that has been in front of Parliament for far too long. It was amended in the Senate, and then we brought it back to the House of Commons, and we amended it further so that it actually worked. Uh, the amendments in the Senate, in my opinion, made it somewhat of a dysfunctional bill at the end of the day. I'm happy my colleagues from all parties got together. We went through this in detail. I thank all of the bureaucrats that helped us in that respect because we had all kinds of technical questions. Recognize what we're doing here. We're parliamentarians that have backgrounds in all kinds of areas, and we're taking a look at environmental protection legislation. There's a lot of science in this, and we're turning that into legislation that lawyers are going to have to interpret at the end of the day so we can actually get some results for Canadians, make sure they have the protection they need, and make sure that people abiding by the law have clarity about how the law affects them at the end of the day. This was an interesting bill to work on, and I thank all the people on all sides of the House and in the federal government that were actually helpful in, uh, in moving it to this point. Uh, environmental protection, of course, is a core Canadian value, and Canada has some of the most robust environmental protection laws in the world. Yet to keep them robust, accurate, and current, they have to be updated periodically. This is the intent behind S-5, which seeks to significantly update and modernize the Canadian Environmental Protection Act for the first time since it was passed in 1999, 24 years ago, as my colleague iterated. S-5 does many things. It recognizes that every Canadian has the right to a healthy environment, a right that may be balanced with social, economic, health, and scientific factors. And it requires the Government of Canada to protect this right, something that we strongly support. It puts language into the Canadian Environmental Protection Act to highlight the Government's commitment to implementing the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. It distinguishes between regulated toxic substances that have the highest risk to health and the environment on the one hand, and those that have a lower risk but should be regulated on the other hand. It also recognizes the importance of considering vulnerable populations when assessing the toxicity of a substance, as well as the importance of minimizing risks posed by exposure to such toxic substances. This was the nub of what we debated ad nauseum at the, at the committee, making sure we got this right. Now, the whole issue around this two lists, because now there are two lists, because the, li the issue around toxic substances, there are thousands of so-called toxic substances in Canada, and as Canadians would be bewildered, the plastic they use in their kitchen is considered a toxic substance. This delineation of lists is trying to make sure that the, the actual toxic substances that need to be regulated and monitored and reduced in the environment, and some completely done away with, are listed on one hand, and those that are used for other purposes, uh, that, as long as they're used effectively, are on a lower scale. That is effectively the major change we've looked at here, making sure that we're addressing getting rid of the real toxic substances out of the, out of the environment for Canadians. But in more pragmatic terms, it gives the government the proper tools to regulate such substances to protect people's health, while considering all the necessary factors. This includes a plan of chemicals management priorities that assesses substances, pardon me, substances and involves consultation with stakeholders and affected groups. It also removes redundancy in regulations by mandating that only one federal government department regulate the same chemical substance and that the most appropriate department be the one to do so. This next part is key. Not only is this bill supported by virtually all stakeholders, the essence of what it does is reduce red tape in many ways. I know, as a matter of experience, that cumbersome and outdated regulatory requirements greatly hinder the ability of Canadian businesses to deliver goods and services to Canadians. One of the ones uh, that we look at here is the whole single assessment regime to assess both the environmental risks and health risks of drugs uh, and some of the uh, right now, it'll be the Minister of Health that looks at both of those as opposed to two regimes it had to go through before. Now it is through one process in the federal government. Uh, we're responding to 35 recommendations that were put forward here, finalized in a 2018 report to Parliament. But S-5 not only eases the bureaucratic burden on our economy, but also does this without compromising on Canada's strong commitment to protecting its environment. 
something we strongly support. However, when it was received by the House, this bill suffered many flaws. For instance, it contained unclear language surrounding the right to a healthy environment. It tampered with the agreed upon definition of the precautionary principle, which is an internationally recognized concept. It introduced new terms that are not clearly defined and would have caused uncertainty with regards to their enforcement. Now, I've heard some of my colleagues debate here. I heard my colleague from Sea to Sky, Sunshine Coast, uh, Vancouver West, Sea to Sky, Sunshine Coast talk about 15,000 deaths a year as a result of uh, you know, combustion in the air. Combustion in the air has always been a problem, but we try and square that in society with why the expectation of your, your life expectancy keeps going up if 15,000 people are perishing because of combustion in the air. We know when we burn things, including burning trees and fields, that that combustion going into your lungs does have an effect on you and it does affect your life at the end of the day. However, we have consistently gotten better in this throughout the world, primarily in Canada, where we're actually dealing with here for a long time. This, repeti this repetition of one-sided narratives doesn't move the proper debate forward. I'll say that again. This repetition of misinformation does not move the actual debate forward on how we solve problems in Canada. We need to recognize that it takes time for stakeholders to agree on a common understanding of new terms. It is not as simple as simply looking up definitions in a dictionary. Legal interpretations are more and more diverse as we go through this process, so it's important in Parliament to make sure we define what we mean in each of these terms. And that's one of the, the weaknesses I've seen in many of these legis legislative proposals that have come forward, is it leaves it open for the courts to interpret going forward, as opposed to us as parliamentarians, to give them that definition of well, what we're talking about before we actually make the legislation. I know I got some support on that from some of my colleagues in other parties, and I really appreciate that. It is also important to understand that regulatory uncertainty is detrimental to all parties involved. Like red tape, it greatly hinders the ability of Canadian businesses to deliver goods and services to Canadians. Thankfully, my colleagues and I on the Environment Committee worked collaboratively to address those issues to produce the version of S5 that we are now discussing today, a version that I believe all parties in this House can agree upon. Unfortunately, the government acted in total disregard of the work done by this committee by introducing changes to the Canadian Environmental Protection Act in its most, budget, its most recent Budget Implementation Act. And I'll go through that here. The Budget Implement Implementation Act introduced an, as an, an account referred to as the Environmental Economic Instruments Fund for reasons that are not clear. And it plays with semantics by replacing references to tradable units with compliance units. If I did not know any better, I would dismiss this as a mere change in bureaucratic arrangements and terminology, but my two decade long career in the financial sector has taught me much better. It is apparent to me that the new fund established in this amendment is being set up as a credit trading mechanism for carbon offsets, overseen and to be distributed by the Minister of the Environment. And changing terminology throughout the Act is an attempt to get around jurisprudence on jurisdictional oversight. It is currently understood that tradable units would be under provincial jurisdiction. So the alternative use of the term compliance units will circumvent that optically only, but function exactly the same. For instance, Alberta's technology innovation and emissions reduction pricing for carbon could be usurped by the Federal Minister of the Environment with this change. And I will note that the TIER program in Alberta is the first and best output-based uh, pricing system in Canada that has reduced carbon more significantly than any other province, any other industry uh, in Canada as a result of its uh, efficiency. In short, we're going to allow the federal government unilateral authority across jurisdictions with this change to SEPA introduced, not in the bill amendment we have, but in the Budget Implementation Act, so something that has nothing to do with SEPA, but is trying to slide in in an omnibus bill. Our, our principal governments are going to be aware of this, and this new language is the change meant to usurp their regulatory authority. Is the country going to see more challenges to federal jurisdiction oversteps as a result of this? 
this is something that's going to be before the Supreme Court of Canada, and I'm cautioning that this is not the right step forward. We should pass this bill and move quickly forward. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we have a point of order from the Honourable Member for Regina Louvain. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I noticed my friend forgot to mention that today is May 15th. And how do you ask, do I know it's May 15th, Mr. Speaker? Because 10 years ago today, I was given the greatest gift of life. My oldest son was born, and I want to wish him a very happy birthday. So happy birthday, Nixon. Dad, <laughs> happy birthday, Nixon. Dad loves you and misses you. Not a point of order, but uh, happy birthday to Nixon as well. Uh, questions and comments? Question and commentaire. Uh, the Honourable Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the Honourable Member across the way. And we did have many discussions in our Environment Committee together on this. Uh, one area that we discussed was the review mechanism. First of all, taking the risk-based approach, but then having an annual review process so that we could look how well the Act is working. Could the Honourable Member maybe comment on the need for a regular review of the work that we've done together? Uh, the Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Well, I thank my Honourable Colleague for the, for the question, and he's a member I work very well with on the other side of the, of the House as far as he scientifically approaches issues, and I really appreciate the facts we put on the table together. But he's, a regular review of these issues is in SEPA. There's already regular reviews of things like the Biofuels Act. It's taken years to even do a review of. So asking the government in its many, uh, many fold uh, applications here to actually go through another process here as we're doing something, another annual review, when it's not doing the annual or biannual reviews that are actually in the act already, is throwing on more bureaucracy. Review of our legislation is important. How we're going to get to it with the many issues that are already not being met by this government is a, is a riddle to me. So unless we're going to throw a whole bunch more government wide open here and, and double down on parliamentarians and double down on bureaucrats, I'm not sure how that would actually happen. Thank you. Question commentaire, l'honorable député de Repentigny. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Et je salue moi aussi mon collègue avec qui je travaille sur le comité environnement de la Chambre des communes. Euh, dans le projet de loi, il y avait des amendements qui ont été amenés par le Sénat et qui parlaient beaucoup de la prévention de la pollution. Et euh, à mon grand euh, désarroi, si on veut, euh, libéraux et conservateurs ont voté contre. Mais il me semble, moi, que quand on parle de prévention, ne serait-ce au niveau de la santé, on dit toujours « prévenir, c'est guérir ». Bien, si la même chose ne devrait-elle pas s'appliquer pour ce qui est de l'environnement Prévoir la pollution, ce serait guérir, ce serait prévenir, dans le fond, euh, des maladies. L'honorable député de Calgary Centre. Euh, je remercie mon collègue pour la question. Merci beaucoup. Euh, oui, un, un, un petit peu de prévention, ce sont mieux que le, euh, le, le contraire, comme je dis. Mais euh, je, je pense qu'on a adressé toutes les choses qui euh, arrivent et arriver dans la, en face du, le, du comité et, et dresser le, les sentiers à l'avance pour, pour faire mieux au pays, euh, considérant toutes les choses qu'on doit faire pour tous les Canadiens, tous les, tous les industries et tous les, tous les autres qui sont impliqués avec euh, le projet de loi. Merci beaucoup. Question et commentaire, l'honorable député de Timmins, James Bay. Mr. Speaker, we know all about the need for the precautionary principle in mining communities because we heard decades of trust industry. Well, we can't move too quickly, you know, we can't jump to conclusions. And our graveyards are full of dead young men. If you walk in the graveyards of Timmins or Kirkland Lake, up to 1955, the average life of an immigrant miner was 41 years old. They died of silicosis. They died from the radon. They died from the radiation. Later, they died from the diesel underground. They died from stomach cancers, from the uh, oils that were on the drills. And all the time, we were told, well, you know, we don't know how to prove this. The way we proved it, they called it the Widow's Project. They went door to door to meet the widows to find out what happened in those stopes, all while industry said, trust us, everything's fine. The precautionary principle has been paid in the lifeblood of workers, and it has been paid in the lifeblood of Canadians. The Honourable Member for Calgary Centre. Well, I thank my colleague for the, for the story. I'm not sure I saw a question in there. I do agree with him that we need to protect the lives of our workers across Canada first and foremost. And the Environmental Protection Act, as much as it can, should be protecting 
those work sites. I will point out as well that the number one site for reclamation in Canada right now is the giant mine in Northwest Territories, which is overseen by federal jurisdiction, $4 billion. It's going to cost the federal government in order to fix the, the pollution that's at that mine at this point in time. This is a failure of regulatory oversight. It's a failure for the environment. And it's a failure we can't continue to make in Canada. So holding officials accountable for their outcomes that are affecting both our environment and the lives of our people, our workers, and the people affected by that environment is essential to this country going forward. Thank you very much. That's all the time, but I'm going to do